all rivers lead to the sea, and no more so than the Avon does to the Bristol Channel. It is this navigable river that gave rise to Bristol's wealth and prosperity. Cutting its way through a gorge of staggering beauty, straddled by Brunel's suspension bridge, it meanders into the very heart of the city. The city is famous for its maritime history. John Cabot sailed from here in 1497, discovering the northeastern coastlines of Canada and North America. It's home too to that famous wrought iron ship, the SS Great Britain, and more recently to the replica of John Cabot's Matthew. But I want to talk about some other boats, perhaps not quite so grand, but nevertheless important in the role that they played in the success of this busy trading city. I'm going to find out about the history of the Bristol Channel pilot cutters. Their modern day counterparts and experience the thrill of racing in historic boats down one of the most dangerous stretches of water in Europe. <laughs> Bristol has needed pilots since John Cabot's time, but we're going to pick up the story at the turn of the 20th century, when the pilot cutter boats were being built. These working boats had only a short life due to the development of communication, so many were left to rot on the shoreline. However, thanks to a band of enthusiasts, several have been restored to their former glory. Two of them are Dick and Priddy and his wife Jan, who have spent years working on a hundred-year-old boat called Peggy. They have been preparing to take her out of winter hibernation in preparation for the summer, and I was invited to join them for a trip down the Avon Gorge. These days, very few ships sail up the river and into the heart of Bristol, for the old docks have had their heyday, and most of the trade is conducted downstream at the ports at Avonmouth. But being on board Peggy and going through the Avon Gorge is a wondrous experience, and it's easy to imagine the ghosts of those former times. When did you first hear about her? She was for sale in Bristol, and the first time I set eyes on her, I thought, yes, what a, what a fabulous looking boat. And how long ago was that? That was very nearly 30 years ago, 29 years ago this year, yep. I didn't really know anything about pilot cutters then, and that's only something I found out subsequently. She was built in 1903 for, um, for a pill pilot, and she was built by Rolls, the best uh, pilot cutter boat builder, I think. <laughs> she was seeking ships down around Lundy from 1903 onwards. The Bristol Channel is notorious for its heavy seas, so wind against tide, you get tremendous seas off the headlands there, so they were very seaworthy boats. They also were in competition with each other. They would race each other out to try and find the ships first. The sailing fleet of pilot cutters didn't exist anymore after the First World War. Can I ask, I mean, it was 30 years ago, how much did you have to pay for her? The asking price was £3,000 then, which was probably a little bit high. There was somebody else who was interested in buying it, but was having a survey, and I said to the owner, if by chance they didn't buy it, I would definitely pay him the asking price, and I had to have the boat without a survey. That uh, was very brave. It was really, wasn't it? <laughs> and of course she was quite ripe then, that means rotten. She was just about 70 years old then, uh, now she's just coming up for 100. The previous owner had done some work to keep her going, but uh, there was still a hell of a lot of uh, rotten wood in her. I was quite a novice and wasn't really that worried about that. So this really has been a, a labour of love. It, it has been yeah. over the years, yes. After all these years, I still can come over the hill and see her anchored in the bay and think, what a wonderful boat. And so that, that, that it has been a love affair right the way through with the boat. Every year, the Pilot Cutters Association organises a series of races down the channel. This tests their skills and mastery of the boats, replicating the techniques of the old pilots, for whom speed was everything. I mean, do you take this race seriously? Anybody who's racing and uh, doesn't say they're taking it seriously is a liar. It's always nice to win a race. The greatest thing is to see these, these old pilot cutters uh, 
in out a there. fleet again and out yeah. there again yeah. and sailing as they used to do uh, competitively. We headed out into the channel towards Portishead Marina, the starting point for the race. This year, only three original cutters were able to take part, Dickon and Jan's Peggy, Mascot with its master mariner Tony Winter, and Alpha, skippered by its owner, Mike Humphreys. As you can see, it's rather windy and we're all hoping and praying that the race is gonna go ahead tomorrow. Uh, this rather bizarre gathering Behind me is a group of people who are all obsessed by the Bristol Pilot Cutters and they've come over to this shed to see a boat called the Carriad. Apparently she's not going to race tomorrow, she's undergoing some refurbishment and they're all excited because she's hidden away inside here and nobody's got the key to the door. Luckily, someone found the key and Carriad's progress can be revealed. Now what is it about these boats? causes people like you to rescue them? Well, it's a sort of rush of insanity, I think, is what it is, really. I suppose uh, I got to the stage of my life where I thought maybe there was something else that I might do instead. Maybe a classic midlife crisis or whatever you want to call it. It really makes you realise, when you see a boat being restored, just how much love and hard work it takes to get it back into the water. But just now, Dickon and Tony have another pressing decision to make. Blowing a coolie out there at the moment, isn't it? How do, how do you feel it's going to be tomorrow? Forecast sounds a little bit better tomorrow than, oh, than it? perhaps it was that they were giving us this morning. Yeah. It looks yeah. a little bit more hopeful than it was. Oh, good. I think oh, so, that's yeah. good. Yeah. But the delay gives me a chance to discover more about the race's history. If you look at the history of the last five years of racing of the Bristol Channel Pilot Cutters, um, the undoubted champion is the Peggy. But there have been days <laughs> when uh, the mascot and others uh, have managed to beat her. Is this what we're racing for, this, this one? This is the Series Cup, uh, the Tommy Nielsen Challenge Cup, presented by Tommy Nielsen. This is our last year's winnings. And I, I notice um, that we won it three times out of five. So uh, really? I can't think is why that, I noticed that. Is that engraved on there? Is it really? <laughs> it's, it's, engraved, <laughs> it's engraved in silver here. <laughs> the owner and master sails so extraordinarily well. He's, ma he's mastered the boat completely. I think tomorrow probably will favour Mascot. It's going to be rough and we're going to have to reduce sail quite a lot. So uh, in the past, uh, realistically, uh, uh, Mascot has won when we've reduced sail. It's six o'clock in the morning. We've all been up for hours and I'm beginning to realise that sailing is a little bit like photography or fishing. It's full of frustration and disappointment. You look like you're about to announce a change of government or something. Yeah. <laughs> Bad news? Uh, uh, yeah, we're not sailing today, I'm afraid. Naturally, it's a big disappointment, but although conditions look relatively calm in here, a Force 8 is blowing its way up the channel. Of course, in the old days, when your livelihood depended on getting out there in the channel and finding a ship, you wouldn't think twice about the weather. Come hella high water, you would be out there this is different. I mean, these boats are not so much mollycoddled, but they have to be looked after. So while we waited for the weather conditions to change, I thought I'd find out how things are done today. Legally, large ships are required to employ pilots to get them safely into port. And in part two, we'll see how it's done.
I'm in Barry in South Wales, and this is where the modern day Bristol pilot begins his journey to rendezvous with any ship that's coming into the Bristol Channel. The Port of Bristol can guarantee a 24 hour, 365 day a year service for any ship wishing to come into port. Despite all this modern technology, there is still only one way to transfer from one boat to another, and that is to pull up alongside in midstream. The Bristol pilot's quite used to it, but it looks a bit tricky to me, but anyway, I'm going to have to do it. 100 years ago, the pilot would have transferred from the cutter into a small punt and row out to the ship. Today, a powerful motorboat takes his pilot alongside. Climbing on board is Nairn Lawson, a pilot with nearly 30 years' experience. Morning. With the pilot safely on the ship, the link-up boat returns to Barry to await the next exchange. And here on the Triumph Ace, a member of the crew hoists the flag to indicate the pilot's aboard. have looked pretty hairy going up that rope ladder but this is a wonderful ship and look at it it's as steady as a rock this 200 meter container ship has been at sea for 30 days its journey from japan has taken it across the indian ocean through the suez canal and round the mediterranean finally its crew bring its cargo of cars to the bristol channel I've got to say, this is a privilege for me, seeing the Bristol Channel from this viewpoint. Yes, it's, it's rather nice. It's a pity the sun's not a bit brighter, but we've got flat home over here. That's where Marconi sent his first message from. A steep home over there, Western Supermare straight ahead of us. Today we're just going to come up um, in the deep water from Barry, which is down here, to the west, all the way up here up the Boyd Channel, in the deep water, and go into Port Britain. The captain of this ship has this chart in front of him. Yes. Why can't he come up on his own? Basically, the captain's quite capable of coming up to sit around Porter's Head, uh, following the chart. When we get here, uh, the captain doesn't know the procedure that we have for docking the ships, and we've got strong tides here. He doesn't know the tug captains, he doesn't know the tug's names, he doesn't know who to talk to if there is a problem immediately, whereas we do. Filled with curiosity, I decided to go off and explore the lower decks. In the bowels of the boat, the engine room is immaculate, if somewhat noisy, but just two floors up, it is a totally different experience. This ship is so surreal. Apparently it will hold 5,600 vehicles. I wonder what the older Bristol pilots would have made of this. Some of the chaps that um, own the old boats tell me that the old Bristol pilots were a very proud bunch, you know, their chests were puffed out and their arms folded. I mean, is it still a glamorous job? Yes, it is fairly glamorous. People, you, you're, you're very welcome when you come on board a ship. Right. Full ahead, sir, please. Full ahead. In company, people find out you're a pilot, they want to talk to you about the job, because it's an unusual job. But we certainly don't have the power that uh, the old fellas used to have. The closer the ship gets to Portbury, the greater the need to communicate with the signal station at Avonmouth. Adrian Smith, a marine officer, explains. This is one of the busiest ports in Britain and one of the fastest growing ports in Britain. We have many considerations to deal with. We have to deal with the second largest rise and fall of tide in the world. All vessels need to move within a certain tidal window. My job differs from the pilot. I'm responsible for the whole of the tide to make sure that uh, all vessel movements are coordinated. The pilot is more responsible for his own vessel. Yeah, morning Alan, we're uh, on the way up now. Should be at Porter's Head Point about quarter to 11, 10.45. Yes, all copied, your ETA Porter's Head Point, 10.45. As we round Porter's Head Point, the tugs, under the radio control of the pilot, manoeuvre themselves into the best position to help the ship to proceed. 
So this is another of our tugs, is it? Coming yes, here. he's going to push on the side. The forward tug is fast, the after tug is fast. And this one is going to push on the side. And I'm going to have to go in the middle. Maybe a right, I won't interrupt you now. <laughs> Portbury Dock boasts acres of tarmac to store the cars prior to nationwide distribution. This ship's 32 metres wide and we've got 42 metres in the lock. In theory, plenty of room. Right, I'm going outside to, to do it from out there now, for me. Piloting ships off the Bristol Channel is a wonderful job. Ship builders spend a lot of money on ships for me to play with. So it's, it's one of the best jobs in the South West, certainly. Leaving the vast shoreline car depot, I headed back to Portishead Marina to await the news of the race. And it's good news, the race is on. It's just gone seven in the morning and the pilot cutters drift towards the lock. The skippers are making their plans. The adrenaline is starting to flow and they can't wait to get out into the more taxing waters of the channel. We'll leave the uh, marina here on top of the tide, seven o'clock in the morning, and we will um, sail down across an imaginary line. We'll synchronize our watches. We'll have a start uh, at about 7.30. So that the start is a, is a free for all, but everybody behaves themselves so that the boats all go over more or less at the same time. Uh, and then we'll make our way as fast as we possibly can down to the finishing line off Watch It. Five minutes now before the start. I think we're all right. I reckon, it, I think it's going to take us about four minutes to get down there. We're going to have to win in about three, four minutes. Just so you know. But it'll be a short board and then there'll be another one, so. No, the green one and the pier head. Two minutes. Please. No, we've got three minutes. Look at this now. Dun, da, da, da. It's like the needing line. And we're off. It's gun time. We've let them get away. Oh no. Because we haven't got a committee boat, we're doing a self starting race, and they've started. Well, fortunately, we were first over the line, although we were two minutes after the start on time. We're in the lead at the moment, but probably not for much longer. If we can snook in here, we will save attack on him and uh, we will just uh, psychologically um, destroy him. Have the water is going to start to flow out of the channel in a minute. Right. And it's going to thrust us down the right direction, which is pushing us up to windward. Now, a sailing boat will sag off this way, but we're going to be artificially pushed up to windward, so we're going to have. Um, a magic performance, you know, um, or we're going to be on the rocks. <laughs> Trying to stop the Peggy getting through our lead by taking his wind, you see, so we're covering him. Yeah. 
Here comes the rain, every photographer's nightmare. I'm waiting for the waft of um, bacon and sausages to come up from the hole. And then you won't see me for dust. The Peggy's tacked close in shore and she's got the, the early tide going down channel, but uh, she, I think she's gone too far in now. We're going to cross tacks with her in a minute, and I think, I think we'll probably be ahead. Bristol Channel work really is all about tides. The tide is actually doing more good to us than the wind is. Dickon decides he's sailing too close to the land and refers to his chart to work out the next move. Could you, yeah, we got, uh, we hold it, hold it round. At the moment, it looks as if it's a two-horse race. Alpha didn't make a good start, and it's unlikely she will be able to catch up. At the moment, we've done better than we thought we were going to do, because we, we made a good start, um, but the Peggy overhauled us in the upper reaches. Once Mascot got a little bit more wind, which she, she does like, she likes a, a good breeze because it's a big heavy boat, then we overtook the Peggy again. But we'll see, there's a long way to go yet. There's a hell of a lot of things to go wrong. We may well find that after seven or eight hours of racing, there's probably still only about two minutes in it. Really? How about that? Not doing so well, are we? What is extraordinary is you can make a one little error of judgment and be just completely lost again. Peggy is falling behind. Things are not looking good for Dickon. Peggy, you must go. Are you happy that we finished the race to Winwood on the 1.30 deadline, or do you want to carry on down to Lynmouth to the Sandwich Boy? Okay, we're talking about opening the beer. Three cheers to Mascot uh, for a very good race. Over. Hip it! Hooray! 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 Well, that's good news. Well done, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for your valiant efforts. Eventually, Alpha shows up. She may be the last one over the line, but she's going to be the first into Watch It Harbour. Next comes Peggy, followed by an old man of the sea, and lastly, the victorious mascot, and a very happy Tony Winter and crew. Mascot raises its colors, and Tony starts to pour the celebratory drinks. He may have won this time. But it's the taking part that matters, and everyone has had a wonderful day.